today we've got Andrew Lotary from Southampton University Hospital. He's going to be talking about Saul's beast disease, uh, its treatment, management, and some and some research stuff. I hope. Um, uh, but also uh, we have uh, Geraldine Hode is with us, and she's the research manager from from the Macula Society. Do you just want to say hello, Geraldine? Hi, everybody. So, are you got, do you want to give us a little bit of an update at the end, as, as, as usual, or just about where we're at with research and bits and pieces? Is that, is that okay? Yeah, happy to. Thank you. Perfect. Brilliant. Okay. Um, there is uh, somebody else is on the, on the call as well, which is, um, which is my support worker, Patience. Um, you may hear a, a, um, a disembodied uh, voice from time to time, uh, and that's just Patience. If, if I get in a pickle, she'll just jump in and help me out. Um, and I will be saying that my, my guide dog, as I always say, is fast asleep on the floor and he does have a tendency to snore. So if you hear any silly noises, that might be him. Okay, well, that's, that's all, this, all, the, all, the, all the stuff to think about. Now, Andrew kindly, is, uh, Professor Andrew Lotary has kindly um, uh, offered to uh, talk on um, source based dystrophy today, or source based disease. Um, you will be able to ask him questions uh, just through the chat function. Um, and I know a couple of people have sent me emails as well with some questions at the beginning. Uh, before the before the session, so we'll see how we get on to that. So, um, so Andrew, welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Colin. So I'll just uh, share my screen. So, um, so thank you for asking me to uh, chat about source fees from this dystrophy. Um, Sure get my First of all, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the many doctors and scientists who worked with me on some of the research that I'll be talking about um, today. Um, also, some of the people who've uh, funded this research in the past, uh, including Gift Side Appeal and uh, Retina UK. And of course, none of this would be possible without the patients that work with us who have source based disease. So source based fundus dystrophy um, is what's called an autosomal dominant macular dystrophy. That means there's usually a parent affected and there's a 50-50 chance of any child of an affected parent having uh, have been affected. We've uh, estimated that it's about 1 in 220,000 people have this disease. Um, so it, Compared to the other macular dystrophies, it's relatively uncommon. Although part of that may be because it may not be diagnosed as easily as some other forms of, of eye disease. And it uh, can cause loss of central vision. Uh, and this can be secondary to new blood vessels growing into the back of the eye and or uh, thinning or wearing out of the cells at the back of the eye, the retinal pigment epithelium. And so I'm showing a picture of, of how someone without this disease would see an image of, in this case, a cat, and then an image of someone who is badly affected by source based disease where their central vision is, is impaired. And uh, you can go on and have further problems and, and, and further damage to the centre of the back of the eye, such as scarring in the centre. Another feature is night blindness, which I'll come on to why that happens in a minute, but um, patients may complain of um, difficulty at night in, in seeing more than other people. So this disease is caused by uh, changes in the gene called TEMP3. TEMP3 stands for Tissue Inhibitor of Metalloproteinase 3. And this protein uh, that's made by the gene TEMP3 it's also called TEMP3 and it's secreted by the cells at the back of the eye called the retinal pigment epithelial cells. And it um, then goes into something called the extracellular matrix, which is basically the space between cells. And it inhibits enzymes that break down tissue. So it inhibits something called matrix metalloproteinases. And so there, a balance between these matrix metalloproteinases that break down 
tissue when it needs to be done and um, and temp temps which are these tissue inhibitors is critical in healthy disease and an imbalance can cause the cells to be become unhealthy so I'm, I'm showing a picture now a schematic of the back of the eye and the cells that are relevant are the, the cells that we use to sense light which are the photoreceptors and they're the cells that are situated in the retina at the back of the eye they're supported by a layer of cells called the retinal pigment epithelium and beneath that is um, another um, a membrane called Brooks membrane which is a barrier to the blood vessels that's at the very back of the eye called the choroidal blood vessels and what happens in uh, Soresby's disease is that that membrane, Brooks membrane, can become thicker, which can impair the transport of materials from the blood supply in, in the choroid to the retina. And also it can become fractured, Brooks membrane can become fractured. And if that happens, um, you can get um, uh, blood vessels coming through from the deep blood vessels into the back of the eye and these new blood vessels can bleed and form scarring and that's one of the, the major reasons people lose vision because in this disease so i'm just moving on to show um, a, hist a, 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 a tissue section from a patient who died by Soresby's disease, and this is actually many years ago this work was done. And what it shows if you look under a microscope at the back of a patient's eyes who's uh, have Soresby's disease, there is a buildup of a thick material underneath the retina. And this is actually um, thought to be the, this TIMP3 protein. Um, and so this, this layer of extra tissue should not be there and, and that has a consequence in that it's difficult for material to get through from the deep blood vessels into the cells that sense light the, 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 the photoreceptors and now i'm showing a graph and this, this is a a really brilliant experiment and, and, and i'll try to explain why it's brilliant but this is um, a doctor called Sam Jacobson looked at how patients' eyes was, were sensitive to light over time. And you have what you, you can measure how sensitive they are to, when you shine very small amounts of light into their eyes, and you get what's called a dark adaptation curve. And he did this in patients with Soresby's disease and saw that this, the, the curve was shifted. And the interesting thing was it looked exactly the same as what you would see in a patient with vitamin A deficiency. So even though Soresby's disease patients have normal vitamin A levels in their bloodstream, in the back of their eyes, in their retina, it's as if they have vitamin A deficiency. And that's why they get night blindness. And the reason for that is that material that I showed you that built up in the back of the eye can reduce the transport of vitamin A from the deep blood vessels, the choroid, into the retina. So if you give people very high, with source piece disease, high, very high doses of vitamin A, you can restore their vitamin A levels in the eye and, and restore their night blindness. Unfortunately, the levels are so high given by mouth that they over the long term they they would be toxic so it's not a good treatment long term but it, it illustrates how that material causes a relative vitamin a deficiency in the back of the eye which is which is really interesting so we know that having studied various patients with source based disease we know that there are 18 different genetic mutations that can cause this disease but we don't really know how you get from the genetic mutation to the um, you know what what 
how this affects the protein. And, and so we have done some work to, to try to understand that. Um, there's been lots of theories, uh, but really it, it's still not clear. And, and it would be helpful to know this to try to develop better treatments. Um, so what, to try to look into this a bit more, we generated um, stem cells from three sore speech patients and also from healthy controls to, to study, because we can't take tissue out of the back of people's eyes, the way you, you study the cells at the back of their eyes is through stem cells. So you can take a skin biopsy and the cells that grow in the skin can be converted to stem cells, which then can be converted into retinal cells. And, and so several of my patients, three of my patients kindly um, gave us a skin biopsy, which then we converted into retinal pigment epithelium, which is a layer of cells at the back of the eye. And I'm showing you some quite complicated slides here, but I, I just want to make a point that from the point that you take a skin biopsy, to the point that you get cells that you can work with is eight months. And that means you have to look after these cells for eight months to get grow enough of them to have something that you can work in the lab. So this is really, it's like, it's like a recipe you're cooking. It's like cooking something for eight months. And if you get any step wrong along the way, you have to go back and start again. So it, it is, um, it is, it is challenging, lab, really labor-intensive work, but but we did it, and we got these cells to grow, and that allowed us to do experiments. And so, uh, what we we did lots of different experiments trying to understand why patients with sores disease have the problems they have. Uh, one thing we did was feed these cells. Um, with what are called photoreceptor outer segments to see if they could uh, gobble up the debris at the back of the eye as efficiently as, as possible compared to uh, patient samples that don't have sore speech disease and, and actually they work just the same. We looked under an electron microscope at the structure of these cells um, in terms of they have little protrusions on the surface, they have um, deposits within them. We looked at great detail and they looked exactly the same out on, under extremely high magnification. We looked at how much of the gene TIMP3 was expressed um, from these cells com compared to controls. It was exactly the same. Uh, but when we, and then we, we measured the amount of protein uh, on a gel and we find that actually looking at it that way, there was a lot more TIMP3 protein made from patients with sore speech disease um, compared to uh, control patients. So this is all quite technical. We also measured uh, their matrix metalloproteinase activity, how well they were, how good they were um, at, uh, at, at, sorry, at inhibiting uh, these other enzymes, matrix metalloproteinase. Um, and we looked at what other uh, proteins were made by these cells, what's called proteinomic profiling. Uh, and we found that 80, 89 proteins were expressed from these cells compared to control, which we then studied. We looked at other genes that they interacted with, and, um, and in particular, we we're interested, we know that in, in another condition, age-related macular degeneration, the problem is an, an increase in a protein called vascular endothelial growth factor, and that stimulates new blood vessel growth. And, and we actually find that in some patients, there was no change in the amount of vascular endothelial growth factor being produced, which was interesting because, as I say, leaky blood vessels is a major problem 
uh, in this condition. So uh, summarizing about two years work in about two minutes here, uh, we find no difference in this gene temp 3s expression levels between source fees fungus dystrophy and control cells. Uh, but we did find that in these cells made more temp 3 protein. Um, so what this tells us that the, the, the mutations don't affect the, the production of the temp 3 gene. Um, that there seems to be an excess of, of the temp 3 protein rather than an absence or a decrease of functional temp 3. And that was a surprising and, and novel finding. Um, and that this protein that's made by patients with Soresby's disease seems to be retained within the cells uh, rather than being secreted. And these proteins, these TEM3 proteins, can, can bind together and join together in what's called a dimer, but we find that that didn't affect the disease process, which was another theory of how Soresby's worked. Um, and we find that uh, the, the faulty TEM3 can still bind these MMP pro, uh, proteins that it's meant to. It's another novel finding and that the, the excess temp 3 protein that we discovered uh, stimulates new blood vessel growth, but this isn't through an increase in production of this other protein, vascular endothelial growth factor. And we also find that temp 3 interacts with another protein called EFEMP1, which interestingly causes another macular disease called Doyne's disease. And that was an interesting novel finding. So that, that's some of the very basic science we've been working on. And I think it's just to say that it's, it's much more complicated than we thought about how having a faulty TIM3 gene contributes to disease. But having done this work, it gives us some new ideas about possible strategies for, um, for treating the disease in the future. I'm going to switch gears a little bit now and just move more on to clinical findings. So uh, I've, I've asked the question, in the pre-molecular diagnosis era, what was the diagnosis? And the answer was basically whatever the old doctor in the room said it was. And there was no way really to tell whether they were right or not. It was just based on their experience because we didn't have a, a ground truth or a way to know whether they were right or not wrong. So I'm, I'm showing a slide of a patient who's got uh, some yellow spots at the back of their eye. And this is a patient in their maybe 40s. And this could be a variety of conditions. It could be uh, an early form of age-related macular degeneration. Um, it, it could be perhaps Doyne's disease. There's no, it's difficult to say for certain, um, but with genetic testing, which is now available in the NHS, I know that this patient actually has Soresby's disease and an early form of Soresby's disease. And I'm 100% certain of that because I can do a genetic test. And that's the major advance that that, that genetic testing is, is available. And Soresby's disease, um, I'm showing a photograph, uh, sorry, a painting of the back of an eye. And this was painted back in 1949 when this disease was first described by Dr. Soresby. Um, and it, what it's showing is lots of scarring in the center of the back of the eye. Um, and so this, this disease has only been known about for a relatively short time. Um, and as I say, it's of interest because it has, it has some similarities with much commoner disease, age-related macular degeneration with these leaky blood vessels and scarring in the macula. And it also causes night blindness, as I explained, we now know is because of this relative vitamin A deficiency. And that's similar 
to other inherited retinal diseases such as retinitis uh, pigmentosa. And this slide just shows that you know, the devastating consequences of having this disease is I'm showing a picture from 1981 of the patient's eye where the, 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 the tissue at the back of the eye, the retina looks entirely normal. And then uh, in 1993, we see there's a lot of scarring in the center. So this patient would have lost their, their central vision. And back in there, the 1980s, there really wasn't much you could do about this, which is you know, very sad. Now I'm going to share a case from a patient I saw, uh, I've seen now for many years, uh, and, and so when she presented, she was a 34-year-old lady who had blurring and distortion of vision in her right eye, and her vision was reduced so she could only see the top line on the vision chart in her right eye. And when we looked in, we could see a sort of a grey patch in the centre of the back of her right eye whereas her left eye looked normal. And if we did a test called the fluorescein angiogram, we could see that this grayish patch lit up because of leaky, leakage of dye from this area, which told me that there was an unhealthy blood vessel there, uh, what's called choroidal neovascularization. So 34-year-old women are not meant to get leaky blood vessels in the center of their eye. And, and, and so when I, when I show this to junior doctors and ask them what the cause is, they'd probably say uh, it's idiopathic, meaning we don't know. <laughs> we, we're not, there isn't a diagnosis for this. It's just bad luck. And then I say, okay, well, we treated this with a drug that inhibits vascular growth factor, a drug called Avastin. And she had six injections of this and after treatment her vision improved just by about a line so it's still pretty poor in this eye but that's because the disease was quite advanced when we saw it and she was left unfortunately with a scar after the leaky blood vessel had, had been treated and which I'm showing here with another fluorescein dye test. So three, three years later the same patient presents with blurred vision in her left eye um, Vision's still very good. And if you look at the colour photographs of the back of the eye, the right eye now has a scar in the centre. And the left eye looks pretty normal, but if you look really carefully, there's a slight disturbance just above the centre of vision. And if you do another fluorescein dye test, you see that over time there's a bright patch which gets brighter and spreads out, and that's a sign of a leaky blood vessel. So she's got the same problem, a leaky blood vessel at the back of her eye, although this time we've got to see it sooner. So she had further treatment with these injections into the back of her eye of Vastin, and her vision came back to 6-6, the normal vision. So that was a great, great relief, and, and all leaky, leakage had stopped. So again, it's interesting if I show a case like this to uh, colleagues who maybe don't treat patients with sore speech disease. They come up with lots of different possible diagnoses, but they don't normally say sore speech disease because there's, it's hard just looking at the photographs to make the diagnosis. But I was able to genetically confirm this case again, and that gave me 100% certainty that this was sore speech disease. And I was helpful to know that because I know that laser treatment is not particularly effective for this condition. And so that helped me reassure me I was giving the best treatment with these injections of Avastin into the eye. And of course, this has relevance and, and um, to other family members, as I say, it's a dominant condition, meaning that any child of an affected person is, has a 50-50 chance of either being unaffected or affected. And I, it's, it's interesting that um, uh, we also study age-related macular degeneration, uh, which affects people who are in their, you know, between 60 and, 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 and older. And if you, as I've done, worked with other scientists 
on the genetics of age-related macular degeneration, if you look at thousands of patients, you see that some of them have also got mutations in the TIMP3 gene. So it, we're just starting to learn that uh, some patients who have been called, I said to have age-related macular degeneration, actually probably had Sorsby's disease as well. And, and it was just probably misdiagnosed uh, as age-related macular degeneration. So I'm just showing a photograph here of a couple of patients of mine who were diagnosed as having age-related macular degeneration, but actually had genetic mutations in, this, in the Sorsby's gene and had mutations in this TIMP3 gene. So I think genetic testing is making us aware that this disease is probably more common than it's thought of, and some patients may be mistakenly diagnosed, for example, as having age-related macular degeneration. Um, and again, this has implications in terms of counseling the patients. And if we do have molecular treatments in the future, of course, it's very important to have the correct genetic diagnosis. So how do we treat, as I say, the main, one of the main problems we face is patients having leaky blood vessels at the back of their eyes. So how do we treat that? So initially we were just treating people as and when they had problems. And, um, and if their eyes settled down, we would stop treatment. But if people, what I'm showing you now is a really important piece of work that we did. Uh, and it shows the course, the vision course of patients when we tried two different ways to treat them. Initially, we just treated patients every time they had a new blood vessel. We'd give them a few injections and then stop and, and then treat them again if they started again. And, and what this, this, this shows the, the vision of several patients treated over several years four patients and when we just treated them these patients who had recurrent uh, relapses their vision progressively got worse and, and that's shown by these lines going upwards so that the, the further up the line goes the worse your vision is and then we thought well maybe this isn't the best way to treat these people and maybe we should just treat them every time we see them and try to extend out the time between injections but even if we didn't see a leaky blood vessel, we would keep treating. Um, and it may, not, it may start off with four weekly, but then if they have no signs of recurrence, make it six weekly, make it eight weekly, go out to maybe 12 weekly or even perhaps 16 weekly between injections, but, but never stop treating. And so for, we started that in 2015 and we started to see that vision leveled off and didn't get worse. So we now think that um, it's better to keep treating patients even if they're if they've had a, this problem of leaky blood vessels and if, and if they've had you know several relapses rather than wait for them to relapse again it's better just to keep keep treating uh, indefinitely and that's what we're doing now and we're, we, we seem to be getting better results in terms of maintaining vision so I think that's a really useful piece of work so what I'm showing now is just um, because it's a rare disease, there's not much published in the literature, but we've actually published seven papers over the last few years. It means that we've published most of the papers on, on this disease in the scientific literature uh, recently. Uh, starting with a paper I'm very proud of, which was the first paper showing that treatment of these, in, these drugs into the eye worked for Sorsby's disease. That was back in 2011. Um, and then describing how the patients with Sorsby's disease might mimic age-related macular degeneration. And then describing how continuing to treat people rather than as required got, got better results. And then I mentioned the stem cell work at the start, which was just very recently published in the Journal of Pathology. Um, so we're, we're trying to tackle this problem both from the basic science point of view and, and clinically. So in terms of the future, 
I think more genetic testing is needed on the NHS. It's not available in every hospital, but there is moves afoot to make genetic testing much more available. And, uh, and so it should be easier for doctors to test patients to see if they have source of disease. And we know from our experience over the last few years that early treatment is best with these anti-VGF drugs such as Avastin. And we know that we need to keep treating uh, for a long time in most, in most cases. Like other eye diseases, a healthy diet is helpful. Smoking can stimulate the production of these leaky blood vessels that are so troublesome. So it's really important not to smoke if you have sore speech disease. There's perhaps some evidence that a, a Mediterranean diet, uh, less red meat, more chicken and fish, more green vegetables may help a little bit. Possibly antioxidants, some very recent work suggesting that uh, vitamins may be helpful, although that's not proven in, in definitive clinical trials because we don't have enough patients to really prove it in clinical trials as yet. And I think in the the not immediate future, but the long term future, it would be possible to treat this disease with gene therapy. The Nobel Prize uh, for medicine this year was won uh, for um, a lady by two, two female scientists who um, developed a technique called genome editing. And that's where you remove a faulty gene um, with some clever chemistry and so it would be possible to in the long term to edit out the faulty TIMP3 gene through a technique called gene therapy and that then hopefully would um, prevent further deterioration and, and I think long term that would be a strategy for treating this disease. Um, it takes a long time to do the clinical trials to um, prove this and it takes a lot of money but I think long term that's that would be a, a viable solution but we're not there yet but we have strategies now to treat some of the complications particularly leaky blood vessels which I think means we're getting better results than uh, compared to 20 years ago when there really wasn't any treatment. So with that I'll end and uh, very happy to answer any questions. I think Geraldine's going to post the questions, maybe. Yeah, we've got one in the chat function so far and a couple of emails that I'll, that I'll read out. Um, I'll take the one in the chat function first. So what is the current state of the, pers of the patient, the 34-year-old lady? How's she doing now? So, <laughs> it's a good, good question. She's had further progression. Uh, she's maintaining... Um, several lines of vision on, on the vision chart in, in, the, um, in the eye that did very well initially, uh, but it has been stable uh, for the last several years. But so unfortunately, some, some further progression in the eye that initially had good vision, but still, still has some some ability to read and has maintained that over the last few years with, with more intensive treatment. Thank you. Okay, on the emails. Um, I was recently informed my wet AMD is in fact Salisbury's. My sister also has wet AMD, but Salisbury's, no com I think there's a mis word missing, no confirmation yet. And our mum has dry AMD. Is it normal or common for a parent to have a different macular diagnosis to their children? I mean, it, it, it's possible that the parent has actually sore speech disease that wasn't recognized. Um, Age-related macular degeneration is a very common disease, but because of the mode of inheritance, um, and as I mentioned, sometimes sore speech disease can be misdiagnosed as age-related macular degeneration. Um, another possibility is that they actually do have sores, the parent has sore speech disease, and it would be it would be interesting to, if, if the, 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 the child of that parent has had a molecular diagnosis and knows what 
the exact change is. It's, it's relatively easy then for a genetics lab to go and test the parent. They know exactly where to look and it's a relatively straightforward genetic test to confirm or not whether the, the parent has the same mutation. So that would be the easiest way to, to sort that out. I suspect probably the parent does have, actually has source disease. Thank you. Um, there's a couple of questions from somebody else who emailed. I'll, I'll take them one at a time. I was told by a sufferer that Salisbury's first appeared in West Cumbria, where I live, and other cases occur in small clusters heading south and east across England, apparently following the progress of an individual as they travelled. Can Professor cast light on this theory, please? So I, I'm not sure. There, there are, if if you have a single mutation in the gene you'd have, that would suggest what's called the finder effect, that, that um, it was, the disease started with a spontaneous mutation in one, one person and then spread out to their, their relatives. Um, it may be that there are some finder effects, but because, as I say, there's, uh, I think, 18 different fault, faults known in this gene, it's likely that there's multiple, it, it started in multiple different individuals and not just a single a single ancestor so um, um, I think it's it's found all, all over the world um, so it's it, it, there may be some spread local spread I would expect there would be in different parts of the country but it, I don't think it came from one one specific ancestor thank you okay I'll go back to the, the chat function now because I think that second question was a that that person had has been answered already. Um, so somebody else has asked about the dry atrophic changes that are part of this disease. Is there any treatment for those? So I, I so we don't have a specific drug that we can inject. They're extrapolating from what we know about a similar disease, age of macular degeneration. Um, as I said, I think there is evidence in that disease, there's a lot more individuals to study that a healthy diet in slow progression, uh, not smoking, um, and that's really all that can be done at, at the moment. Um, the, to say that, yeah, that, that's basically all I would recommend at the moment, there is um, long-term, I think it will require genetic therapy to get, to get more progress. Um, there are some drugs being looked at for, again, for age-related macular degeneration that are meant to maintain, keep cells healthy. They're in early clinical trials. Um, if they're successful, it may be possible to look at them in source based disease as well. But there's nothing at the moment that I'm afraid is, is clinically available. Okay, thank you. Um, quick one, I don't know if this person lives in Canada, but she's asked, do you know if there is research being done on source in Canada? I'm, I'm not aware of uh, any specific research in source in Canada, I'm afraid. I'm, I'm, uh, as I say, I looked, I looked up the recent publications for this talk and I don't, uh, I didn't see any specifically from Canada, so no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, Longish one here. Um, as a patient with Salisbury's, I'm under my local ophthalmology clinic and they will only inject me if I get a further leak. I've only had one so far three years ago. Are you suggesting we need regular anti-veg F injections? Um, should I be asking them to inject yeah. me despite this? I, and it's I, yeah, I, I think if you've just had one episode and it's stable, you, you don't need repeated injections. If you're turning up every couple of months at, at the clinic, um, then, then you probably do need very, you know, similar approach to what has been developed for age-related macular degeneration, what's called a treat and extend protocol. 
where you treat and try to extend interval, but you keep treating between injections. And that's what I find helpful for patients who have frequent treatment. But if, if you've been stable for three years, then, then that's prob that's, I don't think there's any indication to treat, but if, I think every time that you have a relapse, there's, there's a risk of a little bit further damage, permanent damage to the eye. And so if that is happening on a regular basis, then it's probably best to have ex ongoing treatment. Um, you know, so a one-off, once and no more, it's probably okay. But you know, if you've had maybe three episodes in the last six months, then it may be worth having a serious chat about more, more long-term therapy. Yeah. And, and she does ask about referral to you instead of her current hospital. <laughs> Should yeah, we, she seek referral? Um, if they don't agree, I think is the answer. The, uh, I'm very happy to see people. It, we, it is difficult in COVID. We, we have limited capacity. That, not that said, I'm very happy to see patients, um, you know, if they're referred to their, their GP. Um, yeah, but, you know, talk to your own. If, if you live a long way away, it might be better, you know, to be treated in your, your local um, major, you know, you know, because it is quite spot specialized, you know, if there's a teaching hospital, a university affiliated teaching hospital near you, that's probably, you know, perhaps uh, a good place to get, get treated because there may be more experience in these sort of rare forms of retinal disease. Um, and the same, and, and any, re any retinal clinic could, could treat, you know, uh, would be very, the uh, treats patients, for example, with macular degeneration should be able to treat people with sores loose disease. Um, but as I say, I'm very happy to see people, if, but it's just, may, it might be an inconvenience to travel a long, long distance. Okay, that's still coming through um, on the chat. It says, is there any positive reason to recommend the children of a Salisbury's parent to seek a genetic test? So I think it, there's sort of a principle that if, if you're not going to treat a child early, you tend not to do genetic testing until that child can choose themselves whether they, they want to know. So I, I don't think if the child has good vision and, and, and so as we doesn't usually present in childhood, um, I, I think it's probably best to wait until that child is over the age of 18 and can make their own decision whether they want to be tested or not. It's wonderful if the diagnosis comes back as they don't carry the, you know, the faulty gene. Um, but if, they, if the diagnosis comes back, which is a 50% chance it would do, that, that they do carry the faulty gene, that can create a lot of anxiety and, and distress in the family. So it, it, it's not, not something that to rush into because it, it's not it's not going to change treatment at, at that at that stage and it may just cause a lot of anxiety. So first I, I think it's probably best not to do that. But if you you know if someone is very adamant, then it would, it would probably best to have to talk to clinical genetics department and a genetic counselor about the pros and cons of, of, of genetic testing in, in, a, in a child. Thank you. Um, we haven't got any more questions in the chat function at the moment. Um, I've, I've got a small one of my own um, that relates back to the lady asking if they sh she should be referred to you. Do you get ophthalmologists from around the country ringing you up saying, I think I've got a Salisbury patient? Could you confirm or anything like that? Um, I, no, but uh, some patients do, do find me from, from far away. Uh, um, I, I, you know, I, I, I think, I think what I would, I try to encourage my colleagues is to think about genetic testing for if they have a young patient who's got uh, these leaky blood vessels at the back of their eye, that should ring alarm bells. That particularly if there's a, 
there's a family history of, of eye disease and, and, and as you know, we heard on the chat, you know, if, if there's a relative who's maybe been diagnosed with macular degeneration, um, I think the important thing is genetic testing um, to confirm what, what the diagnosis is. Um, but then, uh, you know, it, it should be most, most um, retinal clinics should be able to treat patients with sores because disease and because they, they have the same drugs they're familiar with for treating age-related macular degeneration. Um, I mean, I get the occasional email query, but I guess because it's a relatively rare condition, it's, or at least not diagnosed that frequently, you don't get a lot of requests from other doctors. Okay, a couple more questions have come in, looking at the time, but we're, we're okay. Um, who do I go to to ask for a genetic test? Um, consultant, GP? Probably your consultant. Um, and so some, some eye departments have a budget for genetic testing and some at the moment don't, but they should be able to refer you either to a uh, clinical genetics department that could organise the genetic testing or to an eye department that can do this. So um, it, it does vary tends to be, as I say, university teaching hospitals are more likely to be able to offer this from directly from an eye department. Um, I know centres like Manchester, um, uh, Oxford, Southampton are all able to do this. Um, so it, 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 at the moment it varies, but I think if you, your, your eye consultant should be able to either organize it themselves or um, refer you to someone who can, can do this for you. It's just, it just requires a blood sample um, and, and then go and sent to a lab that can actually test this, this, this gene. It's, it's, it's not a hard thing to do. It's just, as I say, so the budgets vary around the country about who can offer this. Thank you. Um, and you, you've touched on this in, in relation to gene therapy. How long do you think that before that might possibly be available? I know it's a very hard question. <laughs> a while. Yeah, the, I mean, I think it really needs, um, it, it, well, it needs a lot of money, to be, to be honest, to, to make it happen. Um, and so that either needs a company to be interested in developing this um, or, or significant grant funding. And I think that, that's the challenge because any therapy has to go through three stages of clinical testing and you know, probably costs several multi-millions to achieve that. Um, so I, the main, uh, probably the main obstacle is, is funding, to be honest, uh, to make, make this happen. And I don't want to raise people's expectations unre unrealistically, but uh, I mean, I would say that we're seeing more and more gene therapies coming through. And I, and I have talked to companies trying to encourage them to um, consider source-based disease. And I, I think the technology in terms of genome editing is getting, is getting better. Um, I actually organised the first gene editing conference for the funded by the Macular Society about a year, two years ago, uh, bringing together experts around from all over Europe, and that was sort of a landmark conference just talking about this. So there are there are people interested in this. Um, so when the, I you know, I, I think it could be in ten years um, if if there was the, the funding available, but it really depends on that um, to, make, to, make it, to make it happen. Fantastic. Thank you. Ah, that was really, really interesting. I'm just aware of the time. Um, so um, thanks very much, Andrew, for your 
insight, Sue. It's, it's been incredibly interesting. I've learned so much today. I love mm -hmm. the reason, actually. I learned quite a lot. I know, Jerry, you feel the same way, don't you? Oh, yeah, definitely. Thank you. Um, I, ju I just... Um, would it, I think it'd just be worthwhile, just while you're here, Jerry, just to sort of update people what's happening with our with our research program. Of, uh, yes, of course. Yes, I mean it did suffer like all research um, during the early stages of, of the lockdown. In the but research is all our projects that were suspended are now up and running again. Um, there is an ongoing impact in in terms of social distancing on research, but people are trying very hard to to get research. Um, going again and you know keep our research progressing forward um, in terms of the macular society we are continuing to fund research um, we will be launching another grants round next year um, and making decisions on which projects that we're going to be funding next year you know in the, in the spring um, so we are fully behind research we campaign for more funding for research as well as funding research ourselves and um, I think Andrew's absolutely right. I think the principles around gene editing are being established and then we'll see more and more gene editing therapy, gene therapies coming forward in the future. I know, it's really exciting. Um, I remember, I've, uh, for those of you who don't know, I have Stargardt disease. And when I was diagnosed um, last century, it feels like now, it's uh, over 40 years ago, um, it's... Um, you know, I was told that there would never be a cure and it does seem like, or at least a treatment, and it does seem like uh, for, for people with new conditions or new, newly acquired conditions, my, the, the light is very much at the end of the tunnel, I think. It's, it's really exciting stuff. Um, one of the reasons I enjoy doing these sessions is uh, because we learn about all this new research that's going, on, going ahead. But sadly, that is the last one uh, for this year. Um, but I do have um, some others uh, in the pipeline, or at least thinking about doing some others, uh, one a month starting in the, in the new year. Um, I'm very eager, actually, to get um, someone to come on and talk about gene counselling and genetic testing as, as an actual subject, so we can all learn a bit more about that. Um, however, there is a, a, a one more virtual clinic um, by uh, Cathy Yelfer, the, our chief exec, on AMD. Uh, which is a nutrition one uh, that's next month so keep an eye on the uh, the macular society e-newsletter um, and um, that that will be um, advertised in in there um, because as Andrew mentioned uh, nutrition we know nutrition is is so important for eye disease and good eye health um, so it only really means um, me to sort of thank everybody so Gerald morning as usual uh, Andrew, uh, brilliant. That's been a really good talk. And thanks ever so much for your time today. Um, and, uh, and, and it just leaves me a time to do it. I am going to do it. Wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving. And, and I hope you enjoy your Christmases in your, in your baubles rather than bubbles, we're going to call them now. Uh, so anyway, well, so it's really nice to see you all. And uh, if you've got any questions or anything to, to, to ask, please drop me an email. Um, and, um, and, and that's it. So I shall, uh, I shall leave. So thanks very much for your time. So thanks very much. Bye. -bye. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. Bye.